Good morning. How nice to see all of you. I am the Reverend Dr. Barbara Wells Tenhove, and I am a retired Unitarian Universalist minister, happily affiliated with this wonderful congregation. And I'm delighted to have been asked by our minister, Paul Beckel, who is here today, which is wonderful, to preach for you this morning. So I welcome all of you who are here in the sanctuary. Yay for that. And I know there's some of you out there through the miracle of Zoom. I'm glad to see you too. Welcome, whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever way you're experiencing this, you are, you are so welcome. I want to tell you a little bit about a few things going on here at the Bellingham Unitarian Fellowship, also known as Buff. Uh, you should have on the back of your order of service some announcements, so I hope you'll take a look at those. But I particularly want to note um, that there is an event this afternoon in the social hall in loving memory of Anthony Penzinski, who died a few weeks ago. Um, that's at 2 today. So if you knew Anthony and want to be here, that'll be downstairs at 2. We're also looking for cooks. We're going to be restarting the community night dinners. Yay for that. And we're looking for some cooks to help with that. So check out the information on your order of service for that. And then finally, the UU The Vote organization that's really working to make sure that our values get uh, heard in this upcoming election is unfolding here at Buff. If you have questions, please see Claire Lendy. This place where we are gathering is on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples, particularly the Lummi and the Nooksack. And we're so grateful to them for the ways that they work to sustain this land that has sustained them and now us for generations. Let's take a deep breath together as we acknowledge the sacred ground where we live and worship together. Today I hope to give us a little perspective on the crazy world we live in. I'll be inviting us to look around and to look up through the lens of kindness and distance. I'm so grateful that my husband Jocko, also a retired UU minister, is here with me today to provide support for this service. This is why I never stand in front of him. You never know. <laughs> He's going to be providing, obviously, some humor, but also some music, which you will love. <laughs> and speaking of music, um, I'd like to invite us to sing together a lovely little song about connections called Building Bridges. If you'd like to read the music, it's hymn 1023 in your teal hymnal, the, the bluer hymnal. You'll also see the words on the screen. No? Yes? There they are. <clears throat> and if you're at home on Zoom, you should be able to see them. Let's rise in body or spirit, and we'll sing this song together. And just follow along. Uh, we need a guitar mic, please. Did it, did it go off? Sounds like it's on now. There we go. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> So if you don't know it, listen first time and we'll see in a few times. It's just one person. to you. Will you reach out to me with all of our voices and all of our visions? Friends, we can make such sweet harmony. One more time. Building bridges between our divisions. I reach out to you. Will you reach out to me with all of and all of our visions Friends, we can make such 
sweet harmony. Thank you. And to dedicate our flaming chalice this morning, the symbol of our religion here, I wanted to uh, alert those of you that may not be aware of the existence of our summer camps. There's also a, a midwinter camp under the auspices of the Elliott Institute. These are UUs from all over the Northwest that gather out at the Seebeck Conference Center in Seebeck on the Hood Canal. I wanted to alert you to a buff connection, a particular buff connection of leadership. Um, the, and one particular camp that Barbara and I um, attended this past month, earlier this month, is called Creative Arts Elliot. There are two family camps, July and August, that are a week long, that are a family camp and they have a theme speaker. But the Creative Arts Camp is what it says, Creative Arts, and there are many different options for the participants to, to enjoy um, some training in different art fields, and you do that every morning. But it's all summer camp stuff as well. Well, um, because of the pandemic in 2020, none of our camps happened. Um, last summer, uh, the Creative Arts was the only camp that happened. Um, and it was kind of an experiment and a, a little bit scary to, to enter into a, a collective um, community experience in August of 2021. But they had asked me and Barbara to be the deans, which are the leaders of the whole operation. And so we, we led that camp a year ago, and it, it went very well enough so that they were going to do it. And they did all the camps this summer happily. And we went to the July family camp, and then we went to the, the August creative arts camp, which we handed the baton of leadership over to Laura Lee McLeod and Drew Betts of this congregation. And Drew's in the back there. I think maybe Laura Lee's here. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, they took over for this summer and carried on. So the, the buff connection of leadership uh, at the dean level uh, continued. Well, um, they now have completed their turn, and they have now passed the baton to none other than Rory McLeod and their daughter, uh, Kaylin, who are going to be deans next summer. So the, the buff ownership of leader, creative leadership, creative arts camp continues. But others in the families, including Mike Betts and Neil uh, McLeod, have also had leadership roles in the camp as well. So I honor and dedicate our chalice to the, uh, the ways that congregation uh, leadership experience um, uh, extends into the wider UU world, uh, at least to our, our creative arts camp. So I thank and honor those families uh, for their good leadership. And as we say our covenant together, if you would, please, hopefully, well, I guess the words aren't going to be up there, but they're, yeah, they go. Love is the spirit of this church, ship, and service gives it life. Celebrating our diversity and joined by a quest for truth, we work for peace and honor all creation. This is our covenant. And so I want to share with you a little story that I discovered in preparation for this service. And it's, it's really sweet. It's called Kindness is My Superpower. But I, I particularly picked this version because the, the person who's reading it has the most charming voice. So I hope you enjoy Kindness is My Superpower by Alicia Ortego. Uh, I am delighted to introduce um, our speaker this morning who will be telling us a little bit about Northwest Youth Services. Deja, I was going to pronounce it, Katrovsky will come and share with us a little bit about this important organization that we'll be supporting. Hey everyone, so Deja Kotrovsky. Uh, <laughs> I married a Russian man and that's what I got. <laughs> so um, I'm the Director of Advancement at Northwest Youth Services and uh, to tell you a little bit about what we do, uh, we are a nonprofit organization that works with youth experiencing homelessness. Um, so about 13 to 24 is our age range. We're actually one of the only nonprofits in Whatcom County that specializes in youth and works with youth. 
Um, we have a one program system, so housing is a lot of what we do, um, getting um, youth off streets, having them um, either helping them get housing, helping them pay for their rent, um, or um, we even have a housing for uh, 13 to 17 year olds. Um, and so we don't only focus on that, we really believe in a holistic approach of focusing on um, multiple parts of having a job, getting a, getting education if they, if they choose to do so, um, mental health, things like that. So we really try to um, be holistic in our approach and know that we believe housing first is a way, is the first stepping stone to getting other things, but um, after that allowing the youth to choose what they think is um, best for their future and helping them get to that point. Um, and so I just came into this position about three weeks ago, <laughs> and I specifically came to Northwest Youth Services from a different organization because I really believe in, oh, I could get emotional thinking about it. <laughs> I really believe in what Northwest Youth Services does. Um, they, they help a lot of people, and they help a lot of youth who, who really need it in this community. Wow, I didn't know I was going to cry. <laughs> It will. You're right. And so I know, um, I believe Hank's somewhere here in this audience. Um, I, some of y'all might know um, about his son, Mac, that passed. Um, and stories like that <laughs> are what makes me, knowing that our services were such a great help to such a young person, are honestly why I do this. I don't work in direct service. I do the behind the scenes. I fundraise. I do the designs. I get the website looking great because I believe that we have such amazing people who are working direct service work, um, really supporting the youth in this community. And I really see us as a community member just helping other community members. Um, and so, yeah, thank you. I appreciate um, y'all allowing me to be here today um, and inviting me. It's honestly such an honor. And this is why I do what I do is to be able to stand in front of people like you all and um, tell stories, share about ourselves. And um, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Deja. Obviously, they have amazing people working throughout the whole organization. And we're delighted that you were able to come and be with us today, Deja. So um, those of you in the sanctuary probably know how this works. There will be some nice people who are going to walk through the aisles while Jocko sings you a song, and they will have baskets into which you can imagine donating generously, either with a check or with cash. Anything that goes in those baskets will go to Northwest Youth Services unless you specifically say it's just to go to Buff. If you are watching through Zoom, there will be a place that you'll be able to see on your screen about how you can donate. So please, this is such an important way that we support youth in our community so that we spread the kindness that we're talking about today. So uh, let's spread some kindness by spreading some green. And if you've been thinking you're all that you've got, well, don't feel alone anymore Cause when we're together then you've got a lot For I am the river and you are the shore And it goes on and on Watching the river run Further and further from things that we've done, leaving them one by one, and we have just begun, watching the river run, listening and learning and yearning, run river run, winding and turning and dancing along. We passed by the old willow tree Where lovers caress as we sing them our song Rejoicing together as we greet the sea And it goes on and on Watching the river run Further and further from things that we've done leaving them one by one and we have just begun watching the river run listening and learning and 
yearning Run, river, run And it goes on and on Watching the river run Further and further from things that we've done Leaving them one by one And we have just begun Watching the river run Listening and learning and yearning Run, river, run Listening and learning and yearning Run, river, run Jocko. Before I invite us into a time of prayer and reflection, let me note that after the prayer, Jocko and I will lead you in a beautiful song, May I Be Filled with Loving Kindness. Some of you likely know it. While you can let the simple words wash over you, if you wish to see the lyrics and sing along, it's, hem, it's hymn 1031 in your blue hymnal. If you're on Zoom, the words will be in the chat. Let's begin by taking a breath together. And if you choose, close your eyes and feel the air move around you. Listen to the sounds you hear and feel the energy of the room, wherever you are. Gracious one whom we call by many names, our prayer begins as all prayers must with thanks. We give thanks for the blessings of this world, of friends and family near and far, of homes to live in, and the natural beauty of our green and blue planet. We even give thanks for the remarkable ways technology serves us allowing us to be together in ways no one could imagine even just a few short years ago. Allow a sense of thanksgiving to fill you and be grateful and breathe. We must also, however, acknowledge our losses. There is so much sadness and grief in the world today. People are dying from the pandemics of disease, hatred, racism, and fear. People are suffering and our hearts ache in response. Let us pray for healing not only for those who are ill or grieving, but also for those wallowing in hatred, greed, and enmity. May all people everywhere be healed and turn in new ways toward a better future. And finally, let us pray for courage to face the many challenges ahead. There is so much we must do, so much we are called to create in these challenging times. May we find deep in our hearts the capacity to move forward, knowing that love and kindness will guide us. And so may we be filled with loving kindness and offer it not just to ourselves, but to all people. And so we sing, may I and you and we be filled with loving kindness 
be well and be whole. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be whole. May you, may you be filled. Amen. And blessed be. That song is so powerful, isn't it? It just puts the energy of loving kindness right into your body and then offers it out into the world. I'm grateful to the Buddha and Thich Nhat Hanh for putting the concept of loving kindness out into the world and to two of my colleagues, Mark Hayes and Ian Riddell, for setting it so beautifully to music. Let's just take another deep breath and soak it all in. This has been one hell of a two plus years, hasn't it? Like many of you, I can get pretty exhausted by the stress. It seems like every moment of every day requires that we do something, fix something, learn something, anything to make things better. Because so much is broken, it can just be overwhelming to see a path of healing and hope. I often find myself getting bogged down in the ever-present cycle of chaos and crisis and more chaos and more crisis. And perhaps the same is true for you. It's so easy to obsessively scroll through the news feed and forget to look up or look around 
to see what's beyond our screens. Well, this morning I want us to do both. Look up and look around to get some perspective on these times we're living in. Because perspective helps. For me, at least, it provides both hope and healing. I had to think long and hard about what I would say to you this morning. I know I've preached here a lot, as I was your sabbatical minister from Christmas to Easter, and you've heard me ponder many things related to the challenges we're living in. And I also thought about the timing. It's the end of summer, and the busyness of fall is just around the corner. I was tempted to offer you either something super intense to get you hyped up for what's on the horizon, or super mellow, since, hey, it's still summer, right? Can't we just ignore it all? But after I thought about it for a while, I recognized that I might be able to offer you a middle ground. For I remember two ways that I have learned to put the world's problems into some kind of perspective. The first is powerfully personal. When the anger and unpleasantness of the times get to me, I look around for people who are acting kind. As Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers. The second is powerfully universal. I look up at the stars and ask myself, Will this even matter in a million years? <laughs> These two very different ways of viewing the world help me, and I hope they'll help you. Let's begin with the personal. You may have seen one or both of the films about Mr. Rogers that came out in the last year or so. Both of them show a deeply spiritual man. You may remember he was an ordained minister whose mantra, look for the helpers, is really all about kindness. Kindness is so essential and yet today seems so difficult. When I took on the service and started reflecting on this theme, I discovered an organization that encourages people to celebrate World Kindness Day, which happens to be in November. But hey, let's go with it for now. Did you even know that there was such a day? I certainly didn't. But going on their website was deeply inspiring. In fact, their tagline is, Inspire Kindness. On a website full of wonderful quotes, this one stood out. The world is full of kind people. If you can't find one, be one. The organization is primarily designed to teach children to be kind, something we all know is essential if we're going to create a world full of kindly people. There was a sweet video that showed an ever-flowing group of middle school age kids practicing kindness. As one kid does a kind act, another one experiences it or witnesses it, and lo and behold, starts acting kind. A cascade of kindness flows, and it's truly inspiring to see. And our story this morning shows a similar wave of kindness with a slightly younger set. Now, I know from personal experience that middle school age kids can be mean. Do any of you know this from personal experience? I know that bullying happens at that age a lot, and honestly can happen at pretty much every age, but that's a particularly intense time. But I also know that people can unlearn mean behavior if kind and loving ways of being are practiced and modeled. Throughout my long career as a Unitarian Universalist minister, I've worked with lots and lots of kids, and I've seen how loving kindness practiced in the church can make a huge difference in how those kids respond to bullies in other places in their lives. I've witnessed children's lives being transformed by the lived experience of our first principle. Even if they couldn't parrot the words, if young people see others being treated with worth and dignity, they recognize it as kindness and it impacts them. It impacted me during my UU childhood 
and I will be forever grateful to the adult who taught me how to be kind. I've thought a lot about kindness during these trying times. Kindness seems to flourish more easily when we're together in person. Kindness has suffered, I think, due to the distance we've been required to keep from each other as we sought to stay safe, as we sought to stay safe during this pandemic. In the distant past of three years ago, a parent whose kid was bullied at school might be encouraged to invite the bully over for milk and cookies to aim to build a better relationship. Milk and cookies help a lot when we're trying to reach out to someone we're mad at. It's hard to stay mad with chocolate chip cookies in your mouth. <laughs> so I wonder what might be the metaphorical milk and cookies we could be sharing now. When the world seems so crazy, what simple acts might we do to make things a little kinder? Now, I'm going to ask those of you here in person to help me with a brief time of sharing. And for those of you joining through a screen, I apologize, but hope you'll think about this on your own. I'd like to invite you to share with our gathering ways that you've either experienced or offered kindness in the recent past. If you have something to share, and please don't be shy about blowing your own kindness horn. You're allowed to tell people how you've been kind. I'm going to invite you to come forward. You see this mic on the floor. This is so people on Zoom can see you. I invite you to come forward, tell us your name, and very briefly share how you either gave or received kindness recently. So I know there are a few of you out there. Come on down. Oh, Stephanie's going to lead the pack. <laughs> mm, I'm really pleased to get to say this to people in person. I'm Stephanie, and my grandson was diagnosed with leukemia in June. And I set up a GoFundMe and a Caring Bridge and the number of people, even from this congregation, who don't know me particularly, who have donated to that, has been an incredible kindness. Warms my heart every time I read a name. And often it's not even somebody I know or that my grandson or his family know. And that kind of thing where something pretty terrible happens and we all reach out to each other is the most heartwarming kind of kindness that I wanted to bring forward today. So thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And, and once you come on down, so you don't have the walking time. Hi, everybody. Um, my background was in dementia care before I moved up to Bellingham. And I used to always say that my favorite thing to do is to give people a hug, because when you give a hug, you get a hug back. <laughs> so if you see me down at the coffee hour, feel free to hug me. And then it's an act of kindness on both sides. <laughs> Thanks, Naomi. I'm Frank McDonald, and uh, one of the organizations that uh, Buff supports a bit is called Growing, uh, <laughs> growing Veterans at a farm out on uh, King Tut Road. <laughs> I tried to figure out how, to, how it got its name, but uh, nobody ever knows. But anyway, the, uh, I also belong to the Elks, and we have some national uh, grants that we get, one for veterans. We got a thousand. $1,000 grant this year to help them build a chicken coop. So on October 8th, we are going to take all the stuff we bought and their chicken coop that is in kit form, build a chicken coop and put the chickens in a proper, uh, properly and safe place to, to do their thing. 
And then if, if anybody wants to help us, we'd be glad to have you come. Thanks, Frank. And we'll have one more with Sky. I uh, have an alter ego where I work for the Alaska Ferry, and um, I was filling in in the staging area, which is this uh, kind of fun, easy job where people drive up in their cars and you tell them where they ask them some security questions and tell them where to line up in time to get on the ferry. And so I was there uh, a few weeks ago, and um, it was 10 till 3. So everybody's supposed to be in the lot at 3 o'clock. That's when they start loading the ferry, which leaves at 6. But they take a long time to load everybody. So 10 till 3, this woman drove up, and she you know, I ask her the questions, I tell her what lane she's going to be in, and so forth, and she said, is there a store nearby, just a little store, I just need a few uh, food items, and my daughter needs an outfit to wear to school, and, you know, do I have time to do that? And I said, well, technically you're supposed to be in at three. And she said, well, I, you know, it's, you know it, it's okay, I guess, and, and then then she told me that she had just driven from Florida in five days with her daughter and a baby, and they were going to Alaska because she'd gotten a job. And the way that this all happened was her friends had helped her with the cost of driving and getting things arranged and so forth. And she really, she said, I can't miss this ferry. I really have to go. I have to get on the ferry because I really want this job. And she was like maybe in her, well, she had a teenage daughter, so maybe she was in 40 years or old or something like that. And, and I said, well, you know, actually the fact of the matter is I keep these gates open until 5. There is time. If you want to do this, I'll, I'll wait for you. And she said, well, I don't want to miss the ferry. I don't want to miss the ferry. I said, you won't. It's a, I'll be here. Do that. And she said, well, where can I go? I said, you'll go to Fred Meyer's. She said, well, where's Fred Myers? I said, well, it's just, you just got off the freeway, go back to the freeway, go to exit, and so forth. I told her all about it. So she left. So the afternoon's kind of quiet, just a few people, you know, showing up late, and then it comes 5 o'clock, and <clears throat> so she's not there, and, um, you know, <laughs> thinking about her and the baby and the teenager and stuff. And about 10 after 5, they zoom up, all smiles. They said, not only do they have teenage clothes, oh, because she asked me, does Fred Myers have teenage clothes? I said, yes, it has teenage clothes. They found clothes. She said, oh, and we got stuff to eat. We were all kind of grumpy because we were hungry. And we're all set, you know, thank you so much. And it was like, I don't have a chance often to do something kind and have a, you know, immediate, like, feedback. But I'll remember that, that just sort of finding a way for her to do that meant so much to her. She was super grateful to me, and it, it's just a very important experience for me to have. So thank, thank you, Sky. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Well, I'm sure that there are so many ways that people here are practicing kindness. But let's move on and just reflect for a moment. Will these acts bring about a new and more enlightened government or stop climate change? No, or at least it isn't likely. But sometimes we need to be reminded that a simple act of human kindness can heal a broken heart, mend a fractured friendship, or let somebody get their teenager dressed the way the teenager wants to be dressed. These things matter. So I find when the news feed goes nuts and I'm inundated with bad news, it helps to remember that most people are kind and caring. And it's kindness and caring that will move this world along. Yes, I know we also have to do the hard work of justice making. I know we need to help build stronger institutions that will carry our values forward. I know we need to get out and protest. But when you've done as much of that as you can, and you need to heal your aching heart, just take a moment and remember all the ways you and others are being kind. Look for the helpers. 
be a helper, and then look up at the sky. Before I share some thoughts about the sky, I'd like to invite you to listen to a piece of music. Jocko's going to play his harmonica along to a recording of our friend Nick Maxwell from the Edmonds UU Church where Jocko used to be minister and where I preached a few weeks ago. And uh, you'll hear Nick on piano through the miracle of modern technology, and you'll hear Jocko on harmonica through the miracle of being together in person. So as, they, as you listen to this music, reflect on what you'll do today to spread and inspire kindness. Mm, isn't that beautiful? Thank you. Well, hearing music such as this gives my spirit a lift and offers me and perhaps you a little glimmer of hope. And speaking of glimmering and all of that, 
Let me turn now to the second of the two ways I'm finding hope and healing in these trying times. While the personal is hugely important and celebrating kindness and caring, when people are acting so ugly, as my mother used to say, really matters. And it's one way of gaining perspective. But moving really, really, really far away from the personal can help as well. And for that, I turn to the sky. We live in the cloudy Pacific Northwest, where star gazing is challenging. But this time of year, we sometimes get lucky and have those glorious clear nights. And particularly in August, when it gets dark a little sooner, it can be really nice. And just a couple of weeks ago, Doc and I were fortunate to be at the Hubert Conference Center on the Hood Canal, where that wonderful camp Jocko mentioned took place. And as we walked back to our room one night, we gazed up into the dark sky and saw the Milky Way in all its glory. Most Americans live where light pollution or clouds make seeing the Milky Way very difficult. But at Quebec, far away from city lights, it's shone across the sky. Looking at the stars is a very humbling experience. Despite all we've learned over the past centuries about time and space, what's up there is still very mysterious. And even with the incredible images beaming across space to us by, via the amazing new James Webb telescope, there's still so much we don't know, so much we may never know about the stars. What look like tiny pinpricks of light Diamonds scattered on a black velvet cloth, a really giant sun pulsing with energy. Our human ancestors saw gods and goddesses up there. They told stories about the ways the stars moved and the planets, too. Now we know that most of those tiny lights are actually suns like our own, far, far away. Who knows what's happening in the deepest darkest parts of space. Maybe there are creatures up there looking our way and wondering what's circling around our sun. I don't know. No one really does. And I love that. I love not knowing. Many years ago, a colleague of mine taught me to approach mystery with open eyes and a gasp. <gasps> I don't know. Such an approach is a powerful antidote to the mundane realities of our crazy world. Because we don't know what will happen. The story is unfolding. And looking at the stars can remind us to take a deep breath and have a little faith that not knowing the end of the story isn't always bad. to us. Hopefully, it will stop soon in a moment. Ah, there we go. The Milky Way has ceased to sing to us. Now, I am aware that looking up at the Milky Way is really gazing back into time. Depending on which star you're looking at, the light shining in the dark sky left its source hundreds, thousands, millions of years ago. Imagine that. Thousands of years ago, our world was a very different place. And right now, light and heat are being generated in those stars. But every human here on Earth will never live to see it. Our ancestors will, though, in thousands of years. But who knows what that light will find? Will anyone remember these times? Will anyone even care? Now, I don't ask these questions because I think what we are doing right now doesn't matter. Of course it matters. But I do find it oddly comforting to be reminded that the universe is huge and old and unfolding. I find it comforting to remember that there are 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. I find it comforting to remember that dinosaurs went extinct 
65 million years ago, and humans evolved around 3 million years ago. I find it comforting to reflect that most people, in fact, most living organisms who have lived and died on our planet are largely forgotten. And I can't remember who, I can't predict who will remember us, or if there will even be an us, hundreds, thousands, or millions of years from now. Why I find this comforting is, I know, a little strange. But it truly puts everything in perspective, and at times like these, I find that helps. Because the Earth is a lot older and stronger than humans. And I know that it will survive and evolve in new ways with or without us. And yes, I find that surprisingly comforting. It's a very large way of understanding our seventh principle and the underlying reality that everything is connected throughout time and space in a great web of existence. And isn't it wonderful that the latest telescope is called Web? I mean, how cool is that? Now, don't get me wrong, I know we humans have a lot to answer for in, ways, in the ways our planet is changing. Ways that are hurtful not just to us, but also to the rest of creation at this moment in time. There are so many things we must commit ourselves to work at, in particular the challenging reality of climate disruption. I believe, along with the rest of you, I'm sure that we should do all we can to make a difference. But I also know that evolution will do what evolution has always done. Change and grow in unexpected ways. And oddly, that gives me hope and makes me feel a little bit more whole, a little bit more healed. Thousands of years from now, when all of us are long gone, the light from a star will reach the surface of the earth, and there's no way to know what it will find. But today, I'm going to have hope that it will shine on an evolved human species full of kind and generous people on a green and welcoming earth. In the meantime, like Mr. Rogers, I'm going to look for the helpers and practice kindness, at least today. Yes, I know being kind is just a small first step toward making justice come alive in our neighborhoods and our nation and our planet, but first steps matter, and small acts of kindness may bring about the turning and the healing of our world. And that leads me and us to conclude with a wonderful song written by Albany, New York native Ruth Pelham who for decades brought her music mobile into neighborhoods throughout that city, helping children learn music while building community and creating hope. As far as kindness goes, she's a star in the Milky Way. As Jock and I sing this for you, feel free to join in as you get a sense of it. Some of you may even know it. It's one of those songs that sounds like, like it was made up a hundred years ago, but she wrote it, and we thank Ruth for permission to sing this song for the turning of the world for you. <laughs> For the loving of the world 
that we may love as one. With every voice, with every song, we will move this world along, and our lives will feel the echo of our loving. With every voice, with every song, we will move this world along. With every voice, with every song, we will move this world along. And our lives will feel the echo of our love. <laughs> Let us sing this song for the healing of the world that we may hear as one. With every voice, with every song, we will move this world along, and our lives will feel the echo of our healing. With every voice, with every song, we will move this world along. With every voice, with every song, we will move this world along. And our lives will be a show of our truth. And our lives will be a show of our lives. And our lives will be a show of our direction of justice, healing, and hope, may we become stars of kindness, sharing our love for each other in real and meaningful ways. As Jocko extinguishes our same cause as the symbol of our faith, may we believe deep in our souls that the healing of the world is possible if we make a commitment to share our light, our love, and our lives with each other and with our creation. And now, let us stick around the song we sing each week at the end of every service, reminding us of our commitment to the next generation.